original plan was to do a video about each and every state down as we went through the ICW this time and just kind of do general overviews. However, um, there's a pretty steep learning curve in the first few weeks you're on the ICW. And we looked back at the footage we had from North Carolina and realized that there so wasn't any. <laughs> so we kind of decided to change plans and talk more about like the things that we wish we had known before we started the ICW. Things that just like kind of come with experience that might help you out if you decided you wanted to do the ICW. So something that's good to know is that the beginning of the ICW is actually the easiest part. So it kind of eases you into the challenge, but it feels a lot harder because it's new. And then as you get going, um, it gets more challenging. Nor the upper part of North Carolina is probably the easiest section of the entire ICW. You have a couple days to kind of like get yourself into a groove of planning and those kinds of things before it gets super challenging and you keep adding things like tide and current and Shoals. Shoals and, and commercial traffic and all the other things that go along with some of the southern parts of the ICW. The best piece of advice we can probably give you is to have at least two devices to run char plotters on. We have ran three most of the time. We run two iPads, one which has Navionics sonar charts on it. The second iPad runs the US Army Corps of Engineers survey maps on Aqua Maps, which also has the Bob four to three tracks on it. Uh, and we'll talk about those in another video somewhere down the line. But if you haven't heard of Bob, he is. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Bob's the best. Bob's the best. And the third option was usually one of our phones. Um, and that was so that we had one that we could like zoom at, go ahead on and look kind of like what's coming down the line, zoom in really close or zoom out really far, yeah. um, check on like any of the, of the active captain notes, all that kind of stuff. And the beauty with Navionics is that once you buy the subscription once, you can put it on as many devices a as bunch you want. Of devices. Yeah. Um, Aqua Maps is a one and done kind of deal. It doesn't yeah translate between the two, but we just have like the one iPad that we devote to Aqua Maps, which also has Navionics on it. If you have like a fixed chart plotter, I'd think about getting like an iPad or something else just so you can run the Aqua Maps or something like this for Navionics on, just because it's so helpful to have that second screen. And the Army Corps of Engineer surveys are insanely helpful. Um, a thing to note about the Navionics sonar charts is that if there's a known shoal or like like in the case of the ICW where shoaling happens, like it's very dynamic and things are happening all the time. If it happens quickly and everyone finds out about it quickly, like one person, like all of a sudden, like a day later, everyone's running aground. The data that comes into the sonar chart is going to stop for that section. And it's still going to look deep, even though it's not actually deep because there's no boats going over that, that shallow section in order to update the sonar data that Garmin collects. The rock pile of South Carolina, it shows deep all the way up to the edges, mostly because it has no data for the edges, so it just assumes it's deep, but everyone goes right down the middle. Right, but you can see on the Army Corps of Engineer maps because they are actually going through with their like sonar Scanning, scanning thingy. <laughs> you can actually see on the, in that particular instance in the rock pile, it's like red and it's very defined versus on the um, sonar map on avionics it doesn't look like they're there at all so other uh, offshoot is that is don't follow the magenta line yeah. like as a hard fast rule because no. make your own decisions of where to go don't just blindly follow the line because you're going to end up aground several times if you see pelicans standing where someone's telling you to go maybe Maybe not such a great idea to go there. We actually had that happen, so. And there are also have been cases where, according to our chart plotters, we have been driving through land. But in actuality, we had eight feet of water the whole time. Yeah. yeah. You still need to be responsible for your own vessel and need to be making those decisions based off of the data that's presented to you at the time, so. Living on a boat, you really can't escape the cold especially because most of us end up doing the ICW in the fall. And we left mile marker zero on November 15th. We were well into what should have been cold 
in Virginia and North Carolina, um, we got unseasonably warm temperatures and we were still very cold. So a heat source is extremely important. And especially if you're planning to leave in November or December with the cold, if you don't have a heat source also comes condensation. Um, we had mornings where it was legitimately raining inside RV birth. So it makes you cold and wet. And wet. And it's just miserable. We are very excited to get our diesel heater installed. Thanks, mom. Um, <laughs> so we asked for for Christmas this year. Because she was like, what do you want for Christmas? And we were like, heat. Literally, that is all I wanted in the entire universe at that point in time was heat. So we have one that's going to be installed in the next few weeks. And hopefully that'll get us much more comfortable on the way back. We should have a video about it, too. There are sections of the ICW where groceries are really hard to come by. Things that we found were super helpful was one, we provisioned where it was easy. We picked up those things that we run out of regularly, bread, eggs, snacks. Anytime we were within basically a mile of a grocery store. Also, I had done a huge shop ahead of time expecting to be able to go six weeks without stopping. And we probably could have done six weeks without stopping, um, but we wouldn't have had bread for the last two and a half of oh, the last four weeks. We wouldn't have had eggs for probably the last two weeks or Most three weeks. Importantly, we ran out of Oreos. We did run out of Oreos. <laughs> we loaded this boat down. She was sitting a little low, <laughs> um, especially when we got to North Carolina and fresh water. We were, <laughs> we were sitting low. Um, and then whenever we saw a grocery store, we just stocked up on anything that we'd really run out on. Um, and fresh fruits and vegetables. That kind of thing. That kind of thing yeah. Other thing that you can use, which we have found to be super helpful, is Instacart um, or any of the grocery delivery places in the bigger cities. So like Charleston, Myrtle Beach, St. Augustine, basically all of Florida, really, um, Jacksonville, all of those places, you can get groceries delivered to your marina or to get it shipped to like a boat ramp. <laughs> That's definitely helpful, and it's actually less expensive than Ubering to a grocery store and back. We've had great experiences with it. If you haven't tried Instacart for boat groceries, I would highly recommend. We just did Instacart for West Marine. Oh. I should tell them that. West Marine needs, like, a delivery service. Yes. That's probably good. They don't. One surprising thing of the ICW is that you can actually sail more than one might expect. Yeah, a lot of Georgia and... Also North Carolina. North Carolina. There's a lot of North Carolina. Oh, that's true. Yeah. A lot of the upper part of North Carolina. We didn't because there was no wind the entire time. <laughs> yeah, we had like we had like two whole weeks of two whole weeks of no like wind. No wind. <laughs> it was either blowing zero or blowing like thirty-five. <laughs> there was no in between for about two and a half weeks. It was a, a challenge. There were plenty of times where we just rolled out the jib because hey, like we've got a little wind behind us and well, I'll take an extra knot. Yeah, this boat loves to sail. There is a myth that you can make 50 mile days on the ICW every day. And I think it prevails because there are a lot of boats that can do 10, 15, 20 knots on the ICW. Um, and they're like in those places that it's safe to do so, hopefully. Um, they are making those speeds, which means that a 50 mile day for them is only taking four or five hours. Um, if you are in a five knot boat, it's not, it, sustainable. It's not sustainable. Our longest day was 68 miles and we started before it was light and we ended after dark. And I would not recommend doing either one of those things on the ICW. It's okay we, if you're doing those occasionally, but... You're not going to be able to pump those out every day. Especially in November and December. Um, in the spring, there's a lot more light. You're probably going to be able to pull those off. But think about driving your car for 10 hours a day. If you can only do five knots, a 50 mile day is 10 hours. And think about driving your car for 10 hours a day, every day, for weeks. I couldn't imagine. We found the sweet spot for us was like 30 miles a day. Yeah. 30, 35 miles is a very comfortable day in a five to six knot boat. I, I think... I mean, you have like a seven or eight knot boat, probably 40 to 50 would be a little closer to what's comfortable. But... I would say you're not really going to want to go more than six hours a day. 
So whatever your boat speed times six is, is a good indication of how far you'll be able to go. I do think that that's why so many people are like the ICW is miserable is because they're trying to do it too fast. They're trying to do 10 hour days and they're just burning themselves out, which leads us to rest. You have to rest, especially if you're trying to do 50 mile travel day or 10 hour travel days. Um, you have to take days, multiple days, to rest and not go anywhere and it makes it fun because you can actually like explore cities because if you're doing a 10 hour day you're not getting in until four or five at night you're not seeing anything of the places that you're going and there's so many cool places on the icw that are worth exploring and worth stopping so slow down slow down enjoy the trip yeah. We got some really great advice just before we started all this, which is somebody said that the current's going to be with you half the day and against you half the day and just ignore it and hope for the best, which is good advice, not great advice, because at every inlet, the current is going to switch and halfway between the inlet and the next inlet, it's going to switch again. So you're going to have a really, really, really hard time timing current for to, the full day. You're just not going to be able to, to do it. To be in your favor. Yeah, it's just not going to be in your favor all day. There's no way to make it happen. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for some of those current kind of trouble spots, some areas that current can be really, really problematic, like Cape Fear River comes to mind. So um, what you should be doing is looking for any of those kind of spots and there. timing your your day to those spots and those spots only and just ignore the rest of the day the cave Fear river we timed it so that we had the cave Fear river with us because it can be up to four knots and um so we flew down the cave Fear river made the turn at southport north carolina and we had the current against us for probably another two hours after that but it was only like a half knot against us versus what could have been four knots against us in the river. Yes. You will drive yourself crazy if you try to plan more than three days out at any time. So three days and kind of having a rolling three day plan is how we kind of fell into our rhythm by around South Carolina. It was very helpful to me. I had originally, I am an over planner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And I and was I'm kind like, of like a wing it kind of guy. Yeah. Andy hates a plan. He literally would get up in the morning and just be like, where are we going today? Like having no, like not a care in the world. Whereas I was like looking like a week down the road, trying to find anchorages that were okay for Aiden, like just getting myself all worked up. And what I found was, is that if I was looking just three days ahead, the next three days and then okay the end of that day is the plan still applicable for the next two days okay then what do we do on that next third day versus like trying to do more than that i started out trying to do like a week at a time and i was making myself it's crazy just not possible there's way too many there's too many variables too many variables we got you got storms you got wind you got, you've got current you got current you got tides unfortunately sometimes you do have to have you do have to have a high tide and it's in like the middle of the day and if that's that spot's so like a mile or two away so you end up losing like a half day to that to just waiting i'm gonna try to stick to that rule myself on our way north <laughs> we really enjoyed our time in the icw and we'll be heading north again in just a couple months so if you have any questions or ideas for a video on the icw that you'd like to see please send it down below in the comment section and we'd be happy to do a deeper dive on some of these topics. Um, we are planning some videos, but we always love ideas from you all out there. In our next couple of videos, we're going to do just kind of our time in the South Carolina and Georgia ICW areas and we hope you'll enjoy it.